Hey fellow GNTers, those of us who like our spirituality with a twist. In this episode, the first of a four-part series, we have the unique pleasure of chatting with the inimitable, profound, jovial, and enlightening Glenn H. Mullen, or Lama Glenn to his students. Lama Glenn's bio. Okay, this is a long one. <laughs> Lama Glenn traveled from Canada and lived in the Indian Himalayas between 1972 and 1984, where he first met the Dalai Lama and then stayed on and studied philosophy, literature, meditation, yoga, and the Enlightenment culture under 35 of the greatest living masters of the four schools of Tibetan Buddhism. Drawing on those experiences, he's the author of over 30 books on Tibetan Buddhism, many of which have been translated into a dozen foreign languages. His earlier titles focus on the lives and works of the Dalai Lamas. Others of his titles elucidate the practice traditions of Buddhism, especially the Tantric tradition. He has been an international teacher of Tantric Buddhist meditation for the past 25 years. He is also an expert on Buddhist art and has curated a number of important Tibetan art exhibitions and is an advocate for artists of the East. I personally bought several wonderful pieces of art with his help. He is currently at work on a book on Nicholas Rorick, the great Russian painter, spiritual figure, and social activist, and the multiple-time nominee for the Nobel Prize. But wait, there's more. In non-COVID times, Lamagun is an expert in travel to the sacred sites of the Himalayas and beyond. He not only leads tours to these places, but also acts as a consultant and advisor to independent groups wanting to travel safely and meaningly through these sacred sites. Finally, Lama Glenn is an activist in allowing Western folks to support and help make donations to the spiritual practices of those who need that support. This is true of both artists and meditators. I personally have sponsored retreats for those who need financial assistance. And as they say in the Buddhist world, this is a very auspicious thing for both sides. Okay, in this first episode, we asked Lama Glenn about his roots in Canada, his journey to India to meet the Dalai Lama, and what influenced him to pursue this path. He tells stories of Tibet and its relationship to the West, of lives and between lives and the karma holding it all together, and the challenges of being a mystic in the West. Enjoy. Welcome to Jin and Tantra, Spirituality with a Twist, the podcast that takes Tantrism, Buddhism, Taoism, Sufism, Kabbalism, Shamanism, Chinese medicineism, <laughs> and all of the other isms we've been influenced by, and blends them into a tall, crisp, cool cocktail. Your spirit has been longing I for. I want you to get together. Now, isn't that refreshing? I want you to get together. Hey, fellow GNTers, and tears, those of us who like our spirituality with a twist. Uh, as you will already know from the intro, uh, today we have the unique and special pleasure of having on the great and wonderful not quite sure that's a word to use to describe a dude, but still wonderful Glenn H. Mullen, or more simply, Lama Glenn to all of his students. Uh, thanks so much for coming on, Lama Glenn. My joy, my pleasure, my honor, etc. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay, so it occurred to me in saying this up that you and I have had many conversations over the years. Uh, thank God not recorded because they usually involve me and my own personal life and issues and questions. <laughs> but today is going to be about you. Uh, and recorded to boot. Uh, so thanks for coming on to, uh, to share with us. Uh, the first thing we really wanted to get to um, was just to ask you about your earlier life. It's one of the fascinations of the show, why people choose to not only live spiritual lives, but also lives that are just sort of out of the box in general. So we always like to ask people about uh, what led them to make the decisions they made. Not just out of curiosity, but because Daniel and I uh, sort of think and believe it's good to hear the stories of people who have gone on uh, their own way, followed their own way, and uh, had the reward of wonderful, interesting, and important lives. We think there's something really kind of uh, important, encouraging, and inspiring about that. So I think the first question would be, could you tell us a little bit about your early life and um, what led you to kind of leave Canada and head over to India? And kind of what were the things going on in your mind at that time that led you to do that, those steps? Well, as you know, my real focus for the last 50 years in my study, my training, my practice, and also my teachings has been tantric Buddhism. And usually when they discuss an issue, they mention outer, inner, and secret. 
<laughs> uh, secret doesn't really mean secret. It just means kind of non-obvious. But from outer side, I was born on the east coast of Canada, this little town of Gaspé, which was the first place in Canada that uh, Europeans landed during the so-called pre-colonial era. A Frenchman called Jacques Cartier landed here in 1534 and sort of uh, claimed it for France. And later the Brits, of course, had already claimed some parts down in the States, although just, you know, putting up a flag and some had claimed down further down south for France. There was no real settlement done in those days. But uh, it's a, Gaspé is a Mi'kmaq Indian word or a First Nations word, as Justin Trudeau likes us to say. <laughs> <laughs> meaning uh, end of the earth because it's a peninsula with the St. Lawrence to the north and it sort of skips straight out into the ocean. The Gulf of St. Lawrence as it's called but it's really salt water so the ocean. And uh, my parents, my dad was Irish Canadian, uh, several generations, uh, three or four generations, Irish uh, immigrant family to Canada. And my mom was a British war bride. And I think a big influence in my life in terms of those two is that my dad being Irish Protestant, the uh, big issue is the work ethic, work hard, study hard, be good, be honest, don't tell lies, <laughs> except for em embellishing a story a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> And my mom is British war bride. Her father had been in India at the turn of the last century as part of the British effort to bring flush toilets and toilet paper to India. And uh, though when the Indians were, when the Brits were in India, it was one of the countries they really fell in love with, and developed a deep, deep admiration for it. And also he was there at the time of the British invasion of Tibet in uh, 1904 or five. We didn't participate in that, but it was a sort of a very emotional story for all of the uh, soldiers in India, British soldiers, and also it caught a lot of international press because it violated a treaty that England had with both Russia and uh, other parts of the world not to not to invade, especially with Russia all of Eastern Russia is Tibetan Buddhist and uh, Himalayan India is Tibetan Buddhist. So neither of them wanted, neither Russia nor England wanted the other to have a foothold in Tibet and be able to send spies throughout their, their Buddhist regions. And so the invading officer into Tibet took a walk into the mountains when he was in Lhasa, went into a trance so Sir Francis, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sir Francis, young husband was his name, went into a trance and became a mystic. Ah. Mm. And after coming back to England, he became president of the Mystical Society of England and went on to write about 20 or so books on international mysticism. Mm. So I think this made Tibet the most loved, beloved and admired country because when the Brits invaded, he actually, you know, they had to basically, after getting to Lhasa, they had to withdraw kind of quickly because of uh, realizing it was a treaty violation and all of that. But England and the Brits became very good friends. And so there's sort of a love affair, I would say, uh, between England and Tibet that developed. So, for instance, when I traveled to India later in my early 20s and met the Dalai Lama, my rom mom wrote to me, even if you die tomorrow, you could not bring a greater honor to this family. Oh, really? Mm. Huh. Huh. Okay. Now, yeah, as you know, in the Buddhist world, we say that our choice of parents is not random. Uh, that basically after we die in one life, if we're not an enlightened being yet or we're inches from in like still inches from enlightenment oops i'm in canada centimeters from enlightenment <laughs> then we enter the bardo and we sort of swirl around digesting our previous experiences and looking for the graduation door to the next step up on the evolutionary ladder 
And when we do that, we float around the world looking at places and situations and looking for what would be the ideal, both in terms of what we deserve, what we've earned. I would say both in terms of reward and punishment, perhaps. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and also in terms of what will provide our next avenue of spiritual growth, our next window on spiritual growth or a spiritual evolution. Well, I think I probably chose, and so in the bar, in that teaching of uh, the Buddha, it's also in Bardo Tudal, Tibet, and Book of the Dead, and so forth. It discusses how one wanders around when you're getting ready for rebirth, and uh, so you've sort of redigested completely everything from previous life, and you're sort of on cruise control looking for a, a spaceship coming back to planet Earth. And you see a few dozen couples around the planet making love and you sort of check in on them. And uh, if you develop a strong attachment to the mother or passion for the mother, uh, you become jealous of the father and eventually this kills your bardo body or breaks your bardo body into pieces and you take rebirth. And if you become female, kind of the opposite. So we choose our mother and father based on that. So I think I chose my mother because of her strong Tibet situation. Mm. In other words, I didn't sit there in the bardo thinking, oh yeah, she's got a Tibet link. It's kind of an energy process, you could say. Earlier in our pre-recorded session, we're talking about energy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. mm. There's kind of an energetic, in Buddhism we call it karma. Intuitive karma. maybe, right? Karma here means whenever we do something, we leave a kind of a seed or an energy energy button on our santana, our stream of consciousness. And that kind of has a natural, yeah, instinctual resonance with uh, pros and cons of all the other energy buttons floating around. So uh, many years later when I was with a, what they call a melongma, a reader, a mirror reader who sort of looks in mirrors and makes prophecies. He said, oh, Yala Lama Glenn, you were, a, you were a Gyutu monk in Potala in your previous life, close to the previous Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true, but I do think I was probably a yak on the <laughs> rear end of a yak that was ridden by a Dalai Lama, which would account for why I like Dalai Lamas very much and have published 10 or 12 books on lives and writings of early Dalai Lamas and so forth. So from outer side, looking around and floating in the bardo, I chose that as my point of entry. Uh, I suppose from inner, inner side, inner hair in uh, Buddhism usually refers to a kind of an emotional or an intellectual uh, conceptual set. And I think my both my mom and dad had the kind of attitude to the world, which is at once respectful, but at the other side also a bit hesitant in accepting things at their face value. In other words, a little bit suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, uh, I admire that in people being at one time uh, somewhat respectful for your experience, the way you experience things, but at the other time, being a little suspicious that the way they appear is actually the way they, they, they function, the way they exist as it goes on. So I think that side of it, and they were both, you know, very honest, uh, kind, compassionate, gentle folk and like that. So I think that was a kind of an inner connection. Now, secretly, I think it was a misorientation uh, <laughs> because uh, in the Nyingma tradition, there's a, um, famous Buddhist paradise called uh, Zhangdo Palri, the great copper colored mountain. It's sort of a, a heaven for Nyingma practitioners, uh, exclusive heaven for the old school practitioners, you could say, Buddha field. And so Zhangdo Palri literally means a glorious copper colored mountain. So right near where I was born, there is a mountain called Copper Mountain. So I think I was looking for the other one, the Nyingma one. And I just got the GPS settings a little bit screwy and ended up over here. But anyway, growing up, I grew up in a small English speaking community surrounded by, you know, 75, 80% French people. But 
we had our own uh, English schools, English uh, churches, English sports clubs, <laughs> like that. And uh, so although I grew up in French Canada, the French were really only peoples we encountered in the, on the streets or in cafes and stuff like that. It wasn't part of a young person's life because you go from home to school or home to sports, home to church, that sort of thing. So, but it was a very wonderful place to grow up. It's very like uh, Upper Peninsula, Michigan or something like that. Very similar kind of climate where it's yeah. rural, beautiful foliage in the autumn and flowers in bloom in spring and mosquitoes in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were just out there on our little bit of, uh, you know, up to the Upper Peninsula because no one could travel. So that's where we're spending our time. So yeah, we can kind of visualize beautiful. that as Chicago. Yeah. Very, very similar area. Like if you were to drive, if you were to be just picked up blindfolded and dropped in a spaceship somewhere and then asked, are you in UP or in, uh, in Gas Bay, Quebec? You would have to go, hmm, let me see. Um, uh, I'll toss a coin. <laughs> Listen for the sound of French somewhere, I guess, right? Right. Yeah. Well, of course, if you uh, hear people speaking, you would know. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so uh, I went to school and high school here, and then at 17, went off to college. And then later, uh, after college, went to England to meet my mom's side of the family because she was oh. British. And from there, sort of made some links to India. Um, it was very common for Europeans to go back and forth to India, and especially after high school or after first, second year college, many Europeans give their kids a year off to travel and figure out what they want to do with their life. Kind of like mm -hmm. the gap year idea, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So usually they like them to finish first or second year university, but some will do it after college. And... Uh, so there's a lot of meeting, lots of people going to and from India and spending time in India and all of that. And uh, then I met six Americans who had were studying with Tuxay Rinpoche, Professor Norbu, Delam's older brother in the University of Indiana in Bloomington. And they were on their way to Dharamsala to do an immersion program for three months credited uh, in Dharamsala, just kind of go there, stay there, and uh, get their Tibetan together and stuff like that. Hmm. And they mentioned that the Dalai Lama was opening a school for Western people. So I thought, wow, wow, I'll save up my shekels and uh, make it over there. So I did that over the winter and the next spring set out for India and arrived there in uh, July of 1972. Met the Dalai Lama a few uh, days later with a, he used to give public audiences to Westerners on the, sometimes twice a week, Monday and Friday, uh, just sort of informal things. People would walk up and stand outside his veranda and he'd come out on the veranda and just chit chat for 20 minutes, half an hour. Sometimes if it was uh, too hot outside or raining outside, then he'd bring people inside the little audience room that quite comfortably sits about 40, 50 people. And, uh, would do inside. So I met him, was very, very impressed. I mean, he was such a wonderful human being, just really, uh, you know, just very dazzling in his humility, his simplicity, but also you could say his splendor. Just a very, very, just a very energetic, but in a very familiar way, almost like meeting, uh, you know, if you had a really famous uncle or grandfather or something like that, who was famous for being a genius and being good humored and being very, very talented, a real Renaissance man kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. <laughs> and so I immediately was very, very impressed. And, and I asked about the studies program and he said, well, it starts in September. You got a couple of months off. You can either hang around here and, uh, you know, just get to know the lay of the land or come back in early September because uh, uh, it'll be starting in. He gave me the, you know, they mentioned the date. So I went down to the, and it was being run basically out of the Tibetan library. And so that's how I ended up there. And I like to think it's a combination of previous life instincts <laughs> mm. <laughs> towards, mm. towards the enlightenment tradition. Um, 
and also in this life, the blessings of my mother, my mother and my maternal grandfather's connection with that part of the world. And uh, yeah, and uh, sort of a natural affinity spiritually that I have with the, the Indo-Tibetan Buddhism, I should say. But just out of curiosity with that, yeah, we never talked about this particular thing. So this is some of this, I had some familiarity with some of it not. I imagine you like in your teenage years playing bass and, you know, <laughs> and doing those things. So uh, you were kind of like then, if I get it, you were in uh, England kind of on a gap year kind of an experience. You were just traveling over there, right? Well, no, no. After college, I worked for about six months. Oh, you months. were done with college totally. Yeah, I, after college, I worked about six months up north in Canada where you basically are given room and board and all your money goes directly in the bank. Mm. And so, and they pay very well. So I got a nice chunk of change. And uh, so after next spring, I basically uh, packed my packed my bags and made it over, well, drove cross country from West Coast Canada to, to East Coast Canada, then said goodbye to my parents, my family, and from Montreal flew over to uh, England. So, Lama, let me, let me ask you real quick. Um, Lama, what was your, I know it's kind of a random, what was your major in college? And, and I was what, wondering about that too. <laughs> what, what, at that point, you know, going through college <laughs> and, and after high school, what did, what did you think you wanted to do for work? Because I'm sure people asked, asked you during that time, your family and whatnot, like, where was your mind before you went? I had no idea of a career option at all. Um, education was just kind of a, you know, you find yourself on a boat on a little river and you go through kindergarten and then you go to primary and then secondary school. You know, I had the advantage that my mom, uh, growing up in London during that Edwardian period and post-Edwardian period. It was kind of a very strong international spiritualism movement. And so all of the educated Brits had books on Hinduism and Buddhism and Zen and Sufis. And mm. So she had a very good library and uh, she was connected, you know, Theosophical Society was quite strong in London in those days. Right. And so uh, she was connected with, uh, with the Theosophical Movement. And so growing up, I had a strong influence from the whole Asia spiritual tradition from all different sides mm. through her. And very often that in the lunch or dinner, if we had time, she would, if she was reading a particular book, she would bring it out and say, oh, I think we should do a quotation from the Rubiat of Omar Khayyam or... Uh, mm. you know, a very interesting statement from the Tauti King. And this is something we should contemplate. Don't you think? Don't you think that's an interesting thing to think? Can you imagine those silly Chinese people thought this like 5,000 years ago? <laughs> how, well it's, how well it's aged. It still has legs. <laughs> mm. <laughs> she wouldn't say silly Chinese people. <laughs> now, so I'm kind of that I... You know, fell in love with the Asian things right from the beginning, and that was very, very moving. In terms of going to college, I got an engineering scholarship. Mm, okay. Most, most English speakers got scholarships either for engineering or for uh, finance. Mm -hmm. The French all got their scholarships for like romantic 17th century. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of them went into law. Mm. You know, uh, for us Englishers to go in, uh, Anglophones, we used to call ourselves Englishers, but now we have to say Anglophones, to go into law, that was considered like a dirty profession. You're either working for criminals or you're trying to cheat someone out of something. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So our scholarships were either in one of the hard sciences, usually meaning engineering, one mm. of the branches of engineering, or into uh, economics. And so... Uh, because uh, I like science a lot, and uh, I like physics and chemistry, those things. So it went in that way. But anyway, so that uh, after that, I worked up north and went to England. And then in 72, made my way to 
India. So when you were going to India, you didn't have a big like plan in mind. It just was one of those things that happened. You heard that there were these uh, students who had this program. You thought, oh, I'll go and check that out. Were you already turning well, your you mind know, that your life would go that way? You know, I'd already read quite a bit on Tibetan stuff. You know, what's a Tibetan Book of the Dead was out at the time, or mm -hmm. translated by Lama Kezi Dawa Sandup and edited by Evans Wentz, and Life of Milarepa was out, and uh, Secret you know, Tibetan Yoga, Secret Doctrines. I read Lama Govinda's Foundations of Tibetan Buddhism, which mm -hmm. is a real mind stomper. <laughs> Those Germans really know how to make uh, easy things sound very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's some Chinese medical texts that are written by German people. You're like, what are they talking about? <laughs> yeah. Even if you know the field, yeah. Later, when I read translations by the German-Canadian Herbert Gunther, I'd have to put the Tibetan text beside it to have a clue what where it was coming from. But anyway, uh, I mean, I was very, very interested in that whole side of things. But I was very moved by, you know, Ken Kesey, the American writer. Mm -hmm. uh, who wrote books like uh, Once a Great Notion, and uh, Some Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and things like that. I was very convinced that if there were any enlightened people in the West, they would probably be in mental hospitals. So uh, as well as meeting my, my, and you know, we see this said many, many times in the literature, right? The idea of the mad yogi and the, uh, uh, the crazy wisdom and all this sort of stuff is commented upon in many, many texts. And so I thought, yeah, I'm, they would they would certainly be considered either schizophrenic or just totally out of touch or, mm -hmm. you know, sort of uh, any of a dozen different <laughs> prognoses. So and I knew I'd met, met people who had gone and worked in England and the easiest job for a foreigner arriving in London to get was working in a mental hospital because mm. the Brits are afraid of mental illness. They're scared that it's contagious. And also, I think they're still traumatized for World War II, so they were afraid of violence. And mental hospitals, you sudden, often have sudden outbreaks of very irrational, violent behavior. Mm. And uh, so the, one, uh, one reason for my interest in that was this idea that enlightened people or mystical people or people with special talents in that direction would probably be locked up in our society. I mean, Russia did it regularly. Yeah. And over here, the government can't do it regularly, but families can do it to their relatives quite easily. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I never met anyone over here who was even slightly impressively mystical. Mm other than my mother, perhaps, just by inclination rather, but not by experience. So, uh, and then, uh, you know, the Ken Kesey's book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, sort of follows that theme, that if someone is a very talented individual and free thinker and whatnot, they just might end up in the loony bin. And it's a funny one, because I read that one in like seventh grade or something. I remember reading it in the school <laughs> bus and it like blew the top of my head open, you know? Yeah. Both of, of the cuckoo's nest. It was like yeah, mm. both of Ken Kesey's books were absolutely fabulous. I mean, yeah. he was certainly the most talented writer of his decade. It's just unfortunate, he sort of blew his brain mind out in a car yeah. on LSD and other psychotropics uh, through what would you say unsupervised use of them, <laughs> <laughs> excessive and random. <laughs> mm. So when you were Going to India, then did you feel like uh, do you feel did you feel pangs for things that you were leaving behind, or was that once you made the commitment, was it like hmm, I'm okay with this? This seems like the right thing, or did you have? Well, originally, I thought I would, back. I would spend three years there, and then I would be an enlightened being. But mm -hmm. once I started to do the training, I noticed it's a little bit more. Um, in, I suppose organic <laughs> than that. Perhaps in the, I could have done it in three years with certain kinds of steroids, which may might be developed in the future, but we don't have them yet. <laughs> yeah. And so after three years, I uh, decided I'd give it another three, and finally it became 12. After 12, I really did 
I mean, every year I did feel a lot of benefit. I did feel very, very enthusiastic, I would say. You know, not only Dalai Lama, but he chose two teachers to serve as our tutors, uh, Geshe Darge, Geshe Rabdin. Geshe Rabdin had just completed, I think, a six-year retreat and Geshe Darge, a three-year retreat. And uh, they were both very well educated as well, as well, very well practiced and both wonderful, wonderful personalities. And of course, we could visit Dalai Lama's own gurus, Ling Rinpoche, Trijan Rinpoche from time to time. And they gave initiations and teachings from time to time, especially those early days the Dalai Lama didn't uh, do many initiations. And the Tibetan tradition is if your guru is around, usually you don't do it unless he commands you to do it. And so uh, he didn't do much for initiation at those times. He would do some, um, you know, every spring do a two or three week public teaching for five, six hours a day, usually on Lam Rim or some Indian text like Chanti Deva or uh, Arya Deva, uh, Nagarjuna, that sort of thing. But anyway, every year I did learn a lot and I did feel a great benefit spiritually, intellectually, emotionally however one wants to put it. Mm -hmm. And Dharamsala was a very beautiful place to live. You know, it's in the foothills of the Himalayas. My window, the sun came over a 17,000 peak mountain and fell across my bed in the morning, <laughs> which is a nice way to wake up. And uh, it's, you know, reasonable weather. It's not hot like Delhi and uh, what guy or Varanasi in the summer, it's uh, coolish. Winter gets a little chilly, but in the winter, usually the program would close down. The Dalai Lama and most Lamas and most of the Tibetans would go down either to Bodh Gaya or Varanasi for the winter. So we would all go there. So it was a wonderful place to live. And I can definitely relate to this feeling of being in your 20s because I think I started doing Zen back then and I thought, well, I'll spend a few years, get this enlightenment thing done. <laughs> you know, I'll have wrap that wrapped up. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's a little bit more to it, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Dalai Lama often says a problem with Western people is we have this idea of like, it's like turning on a light switch, a kind of instant noodles, that sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It is an organic process and each person has their own, I suppose you would say pace of unfoldment, like different flowers bloom at different speeds and they stay in full bloom for longer, various varying lengths of time and so on. So yeah, so it became 12 years. I want you to get together. I want you to get together. Put your hands together one time. I want you to get together. I want you to get together.